we got a couple more people popping. Yes. Up. All right, wonderful. So I wanted to start with um, a, a, a place that's really influenced my thinking a lot about this as I have been trying to wrap my head around a community with radically different policing than we've ever known here in Asheville. This is a quote from an economist at UC Irvine who, um, and just to sum it up, what she's talking about is the idea that policing does provably reduce crime. It does. And as a slam dunk case for creating a community where there's less chance of your bike being stolen or you being assaulted or raped or murdered, um, policing has been effective. But for a long time, public policymakers have only considered it in terms of these this very basic cost benefits analysis. If we stop a murder, if we stop a robbery by policing the community, then we've saved the value of that person's life or the value of that person's last work or the value of the thing that was stolen. But what that analysis doesn't take into consideration is a broader and more diffuse set of community costs. And the, you know, the, the simplistic way to look at this is the, drudge, the Judge Dredd scenario where if we had just an absolute police state, papers checked on every corner, even if we had a racist police state of, of stop and frisk, every black person walking by, every black person that fit a certain profile, we could demonstrably, you know, we could provably reduce crime. But the costs of that have not been analyzed. And they include the cost of, um, the cost of potentially, you know, just to start off with, the cost of that stop, that police interaction ending in literally with a murder or literally with um, assault, the costs in a known number of unarmed, innocent people losing their lives or losing their freedom every year on a policy of, of over-policing, of, of, of kind of spreading police interactions with the public too wide and too thin. There's the cost of, there's cost like Brian was talking about just before um, everybody joined the call, of um, incarceration, of moving people through the criminal justice system. There's the economic cost of a person who has a criminal record being shut out of housing in Asheville, um, almost all, I would say almost all housing probably at this point, of job opportunities, of, you know, loans, of every kind of economic opportunity and permanently shunting people into a, a class of, um, of the, the carceral state, the criminal state. Um, there is an economic cost of programs of spending that we that we we put towards things like problems like homelessness or or repeat offenses or an economic drag of having people impoverished because they are um, formerly incarcerated people returned to freedom that is not included in this analysis and so where I'm coming from this is not an idea that um, that you know community that community safety is something that is negotiable. I'm I'm not coming at this even necessarily from a perspective that um, the amount we spend keeping the community safe or the amount of effort that we put into keeping the community safe is is negotiable. But as somebody who spends a lot of time looking at um, hidden costs. You know, at work, it's, you know, people think of the risk um, that I take at work as being, you know, the risk of losing your money in the stock market and stuff. But there's, there's, there's layers and layers and layers and layers and layers of risk that were, that are baked into people in my profession to consider. And bringing that same approach to policing in the city, what you run into is just a situation where the, um, you, you, you just you run into a situation where there's got to be this broader story than we could spend thirty five thousand dollars hiring an extra police officer and save the city ninety thousand dollars on a burglary and that's all there is to that transaction that's a bargain that's worth um, that's worth keeping so just to go really quickly through Asheville specifics Asheville's budget is about a proposed budget for this year is about one hundred and eighty thousand. What we think of as the budget is this large 
two thirds running to the right, that is sort of regular city operations. Everything around the left side of this curve is city operations or city special funds that are mostly funded by themselves. And um, they're what's called enterprise funds. They are technically part of what the city spends. So you'll see different numbers like the city's proposing a $180 million budget. But at the same time, you'll see an article saying the city's proposing a $130 million budget. When we talk about the budget, mostly what we're talking about is this large pie slice around to the right here, and not things like the parking fund or the transit fund. If you break down that um, $134 million of the, um, the general fund, which is funded by things like property taxes, sales, our portion of sales taxes that we receive from the state, uh, fees for things like development fees and services, um, some grants and things like that that we get. And if you break it down, you can see by far the largest part of it is the Asheville Police Department. Asheville Fire is next. Um, we're paying off bonds right now, so we spend about $16 million a year paying down debt. Um, and then you work around, and Asheville Police actually um, has as much budgeted for it every year as basically everything else you can think of as a city department that's not listed on this list. So equity inclusion, finance, city legal office, development services, economic development, um, you know, just transportation, just on and on. They all fit into basically the same pie slice. And the thing to know about this is by far the, out of that $130 million or so, by far the biggest portion of it is um, manpower. So just about, I want to say just about $80 million of this circle is paying salaries and benefits, okay? So the larger the share of the department is of the city staff, the larger it's going to be. Um, about one in four city employees are um, work for the police department and far dwarfing every other, um, every other city department. There's about... I think there's about 280 or so right now, but there's budgeted to be 300. There's just attrition and retirements and such. So it means that they're always a little bit under their budget number. If you break down the, breaking down the Asheville Police Department is a hard thing to do, but there are ways to get at it. And a couple of years ago, the Sunshine Request, the um, public data request people, um, put in a request for a line item budget of the Asheville Police Department. As far as I know, there's, this is the only public version of this out here. And I'm, I'm estimating this because I don't have salaries and benefits from two years ago, but this ought to be close to right. What you see is about half of APD's budget in any given year goes to salaries um, for those 300 and so employees. About another quarter, a little over a quarter of it, is benefits like um, state-required contributions to um, retirement plans, um, payroll taxes, other kind of um, taxes, uh, in health insurance, uh, probably life insurance and other things. And then the smallest part of the pie slice is other, is, is items like they've got a, um, they pay the, the APD pays for access to a criminal justice information system. Um, that, that's a national database to what, how they look up if you have a warrant in another state, for example. Um, fleet fuel and such, which is actually a lower item this year than it was in 2017, 2018 when this was created. Um, people say, what about the um, tear gas and the military gear? A share of that probably falls in this item that in 2017 or 2018 was about $600,000, um, but that also includes um, um, items weren't spelled out as this is how much we're paying for flashbang grenades, this is how much we're paying for um, uh, the, the SWAT vehicle, although the SWAT vehicle wouldn't have been in this budget anyways because of the proof federal program that had its own grant. But Somewhere in this supplies portion up in the 10, 11 o'clock range of the pie is where spending on things like bulletproof vests, face masks, um, you know, um, uniforms, batons, uh, shields, where that stuff comes in. I'm going to pause. Anybody have any questions or anything at this point? Okay. 
So um, what, what this shows is that any conversation about reducing the police force, um, the police budget by any kind of meaningful amount is going to entail a reduction in staffing, okay? There is no, well, what if we just stop paying for the militarization of police and all this riot gear and the, the things that were used during the protests and somehow come up with a number that is going to um, signify to anybody uh, reparations or, um, or um, money that can be redirected into community programs to reduce crime and improve outcomes other ways. And if you were able to, I did a little math on this, if you were able to cut all spending on cars and radios and, and uniforms and training and insurance and everything like that, you'd still have to cut about 40% of the police force to arrive at this number um, proposed by the Racial Justice Coalition of a 50% reduction of, um, of, of, of a police force. Some of these costs are fixed, like access to the warrant system, rent and leases on property that the city uses, like the community center in Oakley and the other substations. Some of these are fixed, so it's closer to, you know, to, to achieve a 50% reduction in a police budget would take something closer to probably 60% of um, the police force on the street right now or working at police departments. Everybody with me so far? I see somebody typed comments. I'm not gonna answer them because one of the feedbacks I got, um, I'm not gonna, I'll wait till the end to answer them because one of the feedback I got was I spent too much time staring at the screens. Nina, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering whether I understand, I understand the, the math about reducing staffing if you're trying to get to a 50% so-called defunding. Mm -hmm. There's been some talk about um, retraining or diverting funds to social service support or something like that. And I'm wondering whether you think it's that if, if the current police force were offered the opportunity to, you know, have free education towards an MSW degree, or we're, we're given the opportunity to spend six months retraining in community support work rather than direct police force. What percentage of, you, of them do you, do you think would actually take up an offer like that? In other words, does the current police, uh, police force really, it, are they really interested in the serve portion of protect and serve or is what motivates them the ability to go out and supposedly get bad guys? You know, I, I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's a mix of that. And I should say as a, you know, acknowledging that I am a white middle class community member, my perspective or my encounters with the police are radically different from other, some other community members encounters with the police. I was not always um, a middle class person in Nashville, but I, I was always white, but I, um, as you know, a, a person in my 20s working on um, neighborhood issues with my neighborhood association, um, the interactions that I had with police were almost uniformly positive. And across the board, I saw a lot of willingness to um, be sensitive to, um, to, to issues of racial justice, to be sensitive to issue the economic factors and things like that. Um, the, especially the officers that are designated as community resource officers and assigned to areas of the neighborhood to be the, the more public face of the police at neighborhood meetings and, um, you know, and, and, and interactions with, uh, with everybody from people in public housing to, you know, the, the people who are going to show up at a city council candidates debate. I, I see a lot of sensitivity. I think, you know, that is tempered by, um, by, by, by different realities of the jobs, but, um, 
I most recently I've been interacting a lot with a um, police officer who is assigned really just one guy who is assigned to um, to work the banks of the river where um, the property owned by Duke Power where um, where um, homeless camps are, are set up and his sensitivity to the issues of drug addiction and 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 things like that is really uh, I, I want to say it's, pro it's probably above Justin's pay grade to um, to have to consider so many different factors and how can he sensitively um, serve out this mandate he has to you know to keep people safe to reduce you know small crimes that are sort of ancillary to the homelessness camps to connect people that are um, drug addicted to drugs to services that are going to help them to connect people that are homeless to services that are going to help them and he's he's juggling a lot of that he's probably doing it on a, a, a between 30 and 35 thousand dollar a year um, pay scale you know t talking about you know um extra or more extensive training social work training is like one thing but like one way that a lot of people have suggested to come at this is that you know you could just offer people you could just offer higher salaries for people in those positions and more people that had msws might apply i don't know i'm going to get to the rest of your question in a in a second but i i i i guess to just to circle back to it I can't say um, how many officers are, you know, the the stereotype of just the the, the heavy, and how many aren't, um, and, and how many are, are trying to be sensitive, and how many probably carry a mix of that in them. But um, I do think one option moving forward in this is making a, um, a a group of city employees that were never intended to be just these social workers with a really broad portfolio of different types of crises that they have to interact with um, into too many things. So. Rich, can I ask a question? Go ahead. Um, you know, the, the, I, I, have, I have not seen any sort of, everyone's sort of been discussing this 50% reduction. We want to see a 50% reduction now, um, but I haven't seen any kind of phased, reduction over multiple years and very and it's sort of very similar the language that's being used is very similar when people talk about $15 minimum wage and mm -hmm. in many cases that $15 minimum wage is something that is ramped up to over the course of several years it's not something that happens immediately um, but the language around it scares business owners and other people because they think well I can't start paying $15 minimum wage starting next month um, and so have you seen or, or, or thought about that, okay, it's not, a, it's not a reduction this fiscal year, but we're going to look at some sort of phased reduction or slower increase or something like that? So obviously the coronavirus is limiting the normal sort of constant public engagement that I would be doing three months before an election. And so I've not talked to as many people over the last few weeks. And I've not had the sort of broad group input gathering that I've been able to have in previous elections. I would say that this call is not a monolith. Um, it is, and you know, no perspective in the black community or in Asheville is, is monolithic. And so I would say those calls run a range from immediate defunding. We have to reduce this potential for um, long-term consequences that fall extremely disproportionately on the black community that is just sort of a, a, a take no, um, not take no, I was going to say take no prisoners. That's probably a, a, not the right reference for when we're talking about policing. Um, that is a, a no, just a no compromise position. I would say what I'm hearing otherwise is that a, a perspectives run a gamut from a position that's uh, what I would call, you know, in a way that's not derogatory, a realistic position or a, a position that's open to compromise, all the way down to there's a lot of community members, including a lot of black community members that are going to say, what is this? I, this is not what I'm asking for. 
I'll tell you that from my past experience um, during during campaigns, but also also off campaigns, um, as a neighborhood representative, as somebody interacting with people, especially who live in public housing, there is not the there there are people that are asking me to explain. So wait, what we're gonna we're gonna reduce police by fifty percent? What's gonna happen if there's an emergency, if I need to make a call, what are the potential unintended consequences of this? So I think it covers a range. And I think the next phase of city having this discussion is an input gathering that tends to get a bad rap in the city. It's, it's portrayed by a lot of people as, um, as a delaying tactic or a way to appear to take action without taking action. And, you know, there's, there's some truth to that, but I think, it still remains to be sussed out how what what people are saying okay i can see a phase out or i can see a phased replacement or no i'm going to take let's just take the potential un unintended consequences of an immediate reduction it's too important or i don't want a reduction at all in fact i i want an increase i want that and i i, I I get worried when I see people saying, let's avoid public input, let's skip the process, that I get worried that maybe what we're seeing is people who are worried that the public, the public perspective won't turn out to be such a consensus. You're trying to um, uh, push through a, a measure before it becomes mired in nuance and different perspectives. Um, I would say my personal perspective is that a phased reduction is possible, but it, that it has to, it would have to be a phased reduction. And what keeps me up at night is the implications of, okay, if we agree to a five-year plan or a 10-year plan to um, reduce the police budget by half and replace it with some sort of um, parallel service or some other community support that reduces crime the same way. But what do I say to the person in year one or year two whose kid gets shot during a traffic stop that goes bad when he's not in, when he's not armed or guilty of any crime? You know, I, I understand the push to say this has to happen fast and now, and a delay is too costly in terms of people's lives, and yet. My my personal perspective as somebody who's trying to think a lot about this is that it's not going to happen at the vote in September. That I mean, and if I were if I were on council without a lot more of the infrastructure fleshed in, I don't I don't know that I could vote for that in in September when it comes up, if it if it does come up. To kind of come at that from another way. Okay, this is slides out of place but this is about this is about the one this is the one in four city employees that works for the police department um by far the majority of those are patrol officers that doesn't mean that there's 177 patrol officers on the street at any given time and actually i think per division and there's three or four divisions in Asheville, right or per um district right now there's only a small handful of police officers on the street at any given time um, but there's also support staff, staff, administrative staff, people taking um, people people taking um, phone calls at headquarters, people following up on investigations, and then the hierarchy of chiefs and and um, and office staff. Um, I thought this was an interesting getting to those conversations with um, people in public housing, especially, or people in Asheville's black communities like Southside and Shiloh. This um, quote that I came across while reading about the national debate really echoes what I've heard a lot from black Asheville, which is that our criminal justice system is really great at small stops at um, you know, at traffic stops like we're going to talk about, at stopping somebody walking down the street, at responding to calls for um, trespassing when a homeless person is sitting on a, um, a business's property, but leaves at-risk communities feeling still endangered, even with the, the, the swelling of police budgets and with the sort of continual trajectory of growth of 
of police forces, not only in Asheville, but nationwide, people in at-risk communities do not feel safer from, from murder, not feel safer from violent crime. And this quote ends with, it is at once oppressive and inadequate. And any conversation I have had with anybody who lives in Hillcrest Public Housing, in Pisker View Public Housing, in Southside or Shiloh has echoed that sentiment that you're not against the police protecting us if somebody is firing a gun in our neighborhood, but the cost of that is, but, but what we're experiencing daily is a small stop just pulling out of the community, is a, is a pretext stop to check and see if I'm up to anything on a kind of flimsy minor offense grounds, and yet I still, um, I still feel from fear of being murdered, being a victim of violent crime, all the same way. And that's a, and when a lot of these conversations, when they focus on, well, we have so many police, we keep, um, we keep increasing the police budget, we keep adding new units, and you know, there was a, a big debate over adding downtown units um, because of pockets of crime that were happening in downtown in the high tourist areas. And yet, in some ways, as we're going to see, it's not being reflected in um, our safety necessarily from crime. And so what that looks like is, and this is pulled from a public site that pulls its data from um, the FBI. What we're seeing is for crime rates like homicide, we're actually, um, people's experiences are, I think, accurate that homicide seems to be on an uptick. If you go back to the 90s, we averaged about two homicides a year, by the way, in Asheville. Big spike in the early 2000s. We have spikes that, that, um, that flare up and um, are, are, are sort of you know, tamped down as, from what I understand, a very small number of perpetrators are caught and, and um, taken off the streets. This is also, this is, you're, what you're gonna see here is this is also just the math of small numbers. Because Asheville has a fairly low um, number of murders compared to um, a larger city like New York, Chicago, or, you know, or, or Detroit, or Miami, or something like that, the, the numbers swing wildly from, from year to year, even though they're fairly small differences. These are broken down into a rate, which is per, per 100,000 people in the population. And that's how this rate is being compared to North Carolina's and the United States murder rate. Asheville obviously has a little less than 100,000 permanent residents right now. And in history, it had, you know, back going back to 2000, it had closer to 70, 80,000, according to the census. So a small number of murders. This isn't 16 murders, this is, um, 16 per 100,000, so it's probably 14 murders, um, are being divided into what is the rate for actually, if we had a larger population. One thing that I would point out about this is that these rates always use the official census statistic of, um, of, North, of Asheville's population, but Asheville is on any given day actually almost double the number of people inside city limits of the official census population, okay? Because about 40,000 people commute into the city from the county for work, and about another 35 or 40,000 people are visiting the city every day as tourists. And so we are in many ways a city of almost 180,000 people, but these statistics reflect crimes per the only the permanent population. Does that make sense? Okay, and so I think in all these cases we show a higher crime rate than North Carolina as a whole, United States as a whole. I think I've heard before that our daily swing in population or a daily differential in population between the permanent resident population of Asheville and the outside people in terms of tourists and commuters in filling our streets is the largest differential of North Carolina cities, okay? A lot of people live outside Charlotte and commute into Charlotte for work. A lot of people live outside Raleigh and commute into Raleigh for work. Um, a lot of tourists visit Wilmington and, and, and 
you know, Nags Head and Boone and places like that. But from what I understand, we among North Carolina cities have the largest swing and that throws these statistics off. And I think it's one of the reasons why our crime rate seems to always be higher than a North Carolina average. We are literally basically twice as big of a city, but we're being, uh, you know, we're being weighted or handicapped based on a small official population. So this is homicide. Um, this is the a rate of um, reported assaults. You'll see we're also still lower than in the 90s, although the trend of the last um, almost 10 years has been like pretty continually upward. When you see a trend of a, a one or two year blip, again, because of the re relatively small numbers involved, I will tell you as a person who spends all day looking at stock charts, this middle of this chart or this little bump at 2010 is not a pattern of growth. When you start getting into the period from 2010, 11 to 2018, which is the last um, year that the, the FBI provides numbers for so far, when you see this, the stockbroker is going to say that is potentially a, a worrying climb. Those are our two categories of violent crime. Rapes aren't reported to the FBI in Asheville anymore, and, and overall what was called a rate of violent crime isn't reported to Asheville anymore. When we get, and again, these are still relatively small numbers. I mean, they're, they're not small to the people who become victims of them, but um, they're, your, your chances of being a victim of a homicide or assault, especially if you're a white middle class person in Asheville, are you know still virtually nil. When we get we get into some larger categories of crime, robbery, property crime in general, uh, burglary and larceny, and then also um, motor vehicles. And you don't have to memorize all these numbers. I just want to give it to convey to you the impression that, contrary to what you'll read on Facebook or you know the the kind of calls you'll hear from the community. The trend in most t categories of crime are cons fairly consistently down from the early 2000s and especially from the 90s. This matches the nationwide trend that has seen violent crime in the United States um, shrink by almost half, even in places normally associated with violence like um, Chicago, violent crime rates are down by a third from um, the um, 1990s, uh, Washington DC violent crime rates, I think are down by, by something like a half. Even the rates of sort of having your, your bike stolen off your, um, off a bike rack um, while you're in, at a bar or having your lawnmower stolen off your porch or um, even, you know, the odds of like an actual literal break in, somebody coming through your window or, or door while you're not home are on the decline and have been for a fairly long time. There's a couple of factors that are worth pointing out here. And one is that these are influenced by reporting rates. So if your lawnmower or your bike is stolen, but you don't report it, then you don't, aren't gonna show up in, you don't file a report, then you're not gonna show up in FBI statistics. In the early 2000s, when I was first involved in sort of neighborhood issues, community safety, sort of my first involvement with, with things in the city. We encouraged, we started a program of encouraging people to at least file a report for a lost or missing thing instead of just writing it off. And you can imagine if we got everybody in the city, if everybody in the city said, every time I, my bike or lawnmower is stolen, every time I you know witness graffiti or something, I'm gonna call it in without the actual rate of these things occurring in the community changing, you could see the rates that they reported to the FBI change. But if anything, the, the trend nationwide, the trend by every measure, and surely the trend in Asheville, is that most categories of crime are, are down significantly. In this case, you know, even though they've been increasing the last couple of years, down by half from levels in, seen just you know a decade or so ago if we went back into the 90s even what in what's considered the the nice days uh, or the low crime days of Asheville but people forget that West Asheville had a lot of houses where it was just commonplace to have bars on your window and they called it worst Asheville 
the, the crime rates are, are consistently on the decline. Any questions at this point or comments? I've put all these links on, I should say, I put all these links on a post on my campaign website. If you go to richleeforashville.com slash police, it'll pull up every, it'll pull up a list of links with every resource that I've used in all of these so you can browse through them, including the city budget and that budget breakdown for the police. So, here is a couple of ways to look at um, police activity, and then I'll get into, and that'll be the end of the charts, I promise. I took every police APD citation and arrest for the last eight years, so from 2012 on, off the city um, open data portal. I did divide them according to probably a, into categories that probably don't exactly match categories that the police would use. Uh, when it comes to um, offenses related to driving. So, you know, that would, could encompass everything from speeding to failing to stop at a stoplight to, you know, unsafe swerving lanes. Um, offenses related to drugs could be anything from manufacturing, possession, intent to sell, you know, um, and so on down the road. What I mean to show by this, and we'll have another way of looking at this later, is out of the 160,000 police arrests and citations. So kind of the main, what you consider, I think the main time consuming activity of the police department over the last eight years, the smallest amount of it is what you would consider sort of the, the necessary armed deputy work. Bar burglary, larceny, you might consider, although that category includes things like shop shoplifting you know um but you might consider this sort of a, a traditional police activity assaults you might consider that something okay that's you know if there's you know a person being beaten with a baseball bat you might want an armed deputy maybe not but you, you know my instinct would be an armed deputy responding um up here towards the top breaking and entering um Possession and carrying of weapons can include some like fairly innocuous crimes, including just unlicensed carrying, you know, not even necessarily an imminent public threat. You have to go all the way up to the top here before you get to things like rape, sexual assault, um, uh, you know, kidnapping, um, murder, manslaughter. And so as this debate has unfolded in Nashville, there's been, there's, there's sort of a, a constant refrain of people who I would say, to give them credit, are nervous about the idea of, of um, reducing the police footprint or the police presence in the city or the police activity in the city. And it, you know, it basically comes down to some version of if somebody busts into your house while you and your wife are in bed at night and is you know, raping your teenage daughter, who are you going to want to respond? What are you going to do if there isn't that service in place to respond? You can see that out of the portfolio of time-consuming police activities that really con constitutes by far the smallest amount. And in fact, if you, if, if for some reason, if the city were to decide to um, decriminalize or um, discontinue police stops for vehicle infractions, which, which could be um, expired tag, um, you know, a malfunctioning tail lights, um, you, you know, um, you know, license or registration out of date or something like that. Alcohol related crimes, which could be drinking an open, open container on the sidewalk. It could be, uh, you know, it could be things into, you know, like things that you'd probably actually not want to exist in the community, like buying alcohol for minors. But, you know, the majority of alcohol related crimes, um, offenses that are arrested and cited are public drunkenness and things like that all drug-related crimes. Again, that includes serious um, you know, manufacturing and such, but the bulk of that is small possession, small, you know, somebody with a few ounces of marijuana, something that would be legal in you know, to oh, nearly half of the U.S. population at this point. And if the city were to somehow say, you were gonna um, trespass, which is a homeless crime, okay? So when you don't have a place to stay, 
People end up um, sitting on a lawn. People end up camping down by the river. Sometimes they have intents that go further than that, like trespass with, you know, onto your property with the intent to steal your lawnmower off your lawn. But a lot of these citations and arrests are simply homeless people off of public property, off of the sidewalk into um, a place that's owned by somebody. And if there's, you can imagine if the city were to either discontinue this vehicle, alcohol, trespass, drugs, um, sort of enforcement, or to move that to services that could eminently handle it without being harm, without being necessarily armed or running the risk of escalation. People that were prepared to connect homeless people to services. People that were prepared to get a drunk person leaving a bar at home without him having to get into his car or being disruptive on the street or something like that. Those four categories by themselves constitute half of police activity in terms of citations and arrests. You follow me on this? The website Asheville AVL Watchdog um, came at this from a different way. They looked at 911 calls, service calls, so including calls to the police non-emergency number in Asheville. First of all, I, this is just a mind-boggling number, but they came up with 285,000 calls to Asheville police for service, incoming calls from, um, you know, from somebody calling 911 or the police non-emergency number just since January of 2018. So we're talking about two and a half years generated 300,000 calls for police service. These numbers don't line up exactly with the arrest because not every call, not even by far does every call end with a citation or arrest, obviously. But again, they found that um, traffic is the largest category with almost a quarter of police calls. Um, civil disturbance so again we got some we got loud noise down here at the bottom we got you know drunk people yelling in the street over on the right hand column we have some um some more homelessness related offenses uh, like um panhandling um mental health calls and things like that you have to get off of this page and again this page is on um this is on my um on the website to get into categories that would be classified as violent crimes that you desperately want an armed responder to, being involved in a bank robbery or you know somebody threatening to shoot you with a gun imminently. By far, the majority of police activity in terms of just answering calls from the public are uh, like fairly innocuous. And sometimes it's, it's hard to necessarily justify why an armed deputy needs to be the person uh, walking into the situation. So they have another measure. I was pulling, I pulled 160,000 arrests and citations over eight years. They pulled 300,000 calls for service over two and a half years. You with me so far? The last of these I would say is um, police initiated stops constitute uh, um, a, a fairly high, um, one of the major ways that police interact with citizens and result in a lot of those traffic citations. So this is breaking down those traffic and driving citations. Um, these are the police initiated stops. Not all of them did result in arrest, an arrest or citation. Uh, when I cropped this, I cropped off the top the first column going down here is white uh, suspects. Black suspects is the middle column. Native American is the third column. And if I shared the rest, it would go into um, Latinx and other demographics, although their numbers are, are really small. Um, Asheville's population is, um, according to its permanent census statistics, about 10 or 11 percent black. And so this is where you get into disparity because just going by the official population, any one of these numbers where the middle column is more than a tenth of the left column is a column where black drivers are being disproportionately stopped. You following that? And if you take in to consideration this outside of the community continual population in Asheville, the number of total people in Asheville, again, you know, probably on a daily basis closer to 180,000, 
the bulk of the people driving into the community from outside are um, from the county or from surrounding counties are going to be white. The bulk of tourists into the county are going to be uh, into the city are going to be white. And so that actually skews our, our, our demographics of people within city limits in any given day to probably closer to something like five or six percent black instead of 10 or 11 percent black. But you look at some of these figures and for movement, safe movement violations, this is maybe a rolling stop sign um, violation or switching lanes um, without signaling about a quarter the the number of black um the number of, of black offenders or suspects stopped is about a quarter of the number of white uh, offenders stops about a, a fifth or a sixth of the total and so that's where you get this conversation that we had very um in a very pronounced way in the city a couple of years ago about how if you are a black driver in Asheville, you are three times more likely to be involved in one of these stops than the typical white driver in Asheville. Can you see how that is? Okay. It was interesting that when this came before city council and a um, police captain spoke on it, his answer was his his answer is worth noting, and I couldn't find it when I was researching for this. But it essentially boiled down to this is not a racial a racial bias, and he and he you know in, in fact he uh, he implied that when you are in a patrol car rolling through the city and you see an unsafe motion or somebody run through a stop sign, you are not you know you may not even be able to tell. As a driver, as a, a patrol officer, whether that driver you're stopping is black or white at night, and that he said that these come down more to geographic and economic factors, and from his perspective, that is a that is, you know, that that is a way of avoiding the implication that there's some sort of systemic racial bias involved here. So if all you're doing is you're patrolling. Southside neighborhood or Shiloh neighborhood or a public housing complex because there's maybe that's where a lot of crime is reported or that's where your um, leadership has told you to to focus efforts then because the populations of those communities skew blacker than the population of the city as a whole you are more likely to encounter people there that the, these stops are driven by the bigger crime trends and the bigger sort of, I would say the segregation of the city. Asheville's not segregated like Greenville, North Carolina, Greensboro, Winston-Salem, in the sense that we have a black half of the city and a white half of the city, but we have pockets that are blacker than the city as a whole. And what he was saying is that by these being areas that overlap crime reports, we have patrol officers there a lot. And that happens to be why we're stopping a lot of black drivers. I don't think that lets, um, us as a community, APD or the city of Asheville off the hook for systemic raci racism, if anything, it just illustrates how systemic racism is bigger than police policy, that it goes down to housing policy and the way we've created an economically and geographically bifurcated city, and that 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 that's something that needs to be addressed on its own front, and that it illustrates to me really effectively how systemic racism can be carried out by people who are just from their own perspective neutrally applying laws or neutrally stopping the, what makes it systemic rather than you've got a white hood and robe in your closet is that you don't have to be consciously or overtly or even actually racist to carry out racial disparities and this is a good illustration of that y'all with me so far all right, so basically what it comes down to, I already went through this, but it, this, I do think that there is a strong case for the city to consider the other costs of uh, discriminatory over-policing. And violence and death is something that unfortunately compared, or fortunately for Asheville, compared to a lot of, uh, of, of people we have, few, at least a few low profile, few known instances of. I will say my my perspective on this, which was already 
nudging in the direction of bigger police reforms was really, really had jet fuel pulled on, poured on it by the circumstances around the Johnny Rush beating. And not just the fact that um, a person walking through the community doing something I do virtually every day and crossing a street when I'm not crossing the sidewalk, in coming home from his own job, was targeted by police, chased and beaten. That not only did that happen, but that his, his coworkers and supervisors became willing participants in it. And that he, the, the incident still wouldn't be known to the community at large if it hadn't been leaked by a high up in the police department. It had been six months since that event before the public became um, really widely aware that it had happened because of the way that police departments are set up to, to shelter um, the public from these incidents or shelter themselves from public awareness of these incidents. Um, we have had, you know, police involved shootings of, um, of people armed and unarmed, guilty of crimes and not guilty of crimes, and not, you know, not to get into that, but any death at the hands of a police officer, even in cases where it is just outside the pale necessary, you know, the, the Kiefer Sutherland, Jack Bauer in 24 scenario, that is, is probably so vanishing really rare that it doesn't that it wouldn't even show up in statistics where you shoot somebody and you save the day even counting those any police involved shooting you know has to be understood as a subversion of the american ideal of criminal justice where offenders are guaranteed a right to a trial where small crimes aren't necessarily capital crimes and so uh, that has to be the first Thing that we list in any list of the cost of discriminatory policing. But there's also, in Asheville, you probably can't rent most places if you fail a background check because you have a criminal hit on your record. Um, you are more likely to, um, you're more likely to be forced into a return. You're, you're probably going to be, you're, you're going to be denied most housing. You're going to be denied a lot of jobs. He's still in the city of Asheville where most employers still include criminal background on um, job applications and can legally screen you from even making it into your first interview to make your case for yourself based on having the fact of having a criminal background. Um, the, the fact that I'm just, I'm just becoming aware of this, but the fact that people released from jail and prison in Asheville are frequently returned into the public without even their basic identifying documents like a social security card or a driver's license, that you need to participate in almost any activity. And not because, not because as far as I know, the police or the, um, the, um, the jail or the prison has stolen them, but because maybe you were arrested out of crashing at your, your friend's apartment and your stuff all ended up there. Maybe, you, maybe the police came and broke up a homeless camp that you were involved in and you had to, you had to move fast but the people are returning to the streets without basic identification almost guarantees that they're going to end up back into criminal justice um, and, and almost immediately. So this, this inescapable cycle of being in and out of the criminal justice system that you can end up in from being tagged from even a fairly minor offense. They found when the Ferguson reforms went through, led by the Department of Justice after the Ferguson protests and the Michael Brown shooting, they found that just this gigantic major majority of the population of Ferguson, which was majority black, had been tagged with small civil offenses, small violations, and moved into a system of fines and fees and then court costs and then missing court dates or missing your, your payment of your fine and having extra fine um, applied on top of that. And this huge portion of this majority black city had been moved into a kind of permanent state of indebtedness and, um, and, and, and criminality. And I, I know, and, you know any police officer that I've talked to is going to say the majority of people that you interact with, you're going to find that they've got warrants previous um, previous criminal history because you are you are altered onto a trajectory of being more likely to be homeless, more likely to interact with the police, 
from almost your first encounter with the system. And if that's in the school, because Nashville School District still uses, you know, sworn police officers in, in the school and can give criminal penalties to people who are misbehaving or disrupting school and take them into, you know, juvenile detention, take them into, you know, citations. If they're over 18, take them into adult citations. But people are being introduced in the system in the school. That's sort of a different story than traffic stops. But, but it's a cost that's beyond the cost of unarmed, innocent white people or black people or people of any race being chased, you know, subjected to physical abuse or death that they didn't deserve based on what they were doing before they started to interact with the police. Um, a big factor that economic that economists um, focus on that's included in one of the resources I linked on my site is um, a loss of trust. Ask any police officer right now, and they're going to say that getting even when the perpetrator of a shooting in a public housing project in Asheville is known, it is almost impossible to get somebody to come forward and say who they know was involved, even when it's the own, your own residents and neighbors in the public housing community that are being, that are being victimized by, by, by people driving around with guns. That the loss, that one, there's a lack of trust that coming forward, you'll be protected from um, retaliation by the perpetrators or the per perpetrators will actually be arrested and stopped. But two, that, um, that this history and this ongoing small infraction um, policing of at-risk communities and majority black communities is is leading to a loss of trust that that protects nobody because you know I, I think everybody across the board except for the people actually committing shootings in Asheville is going to say that we would rather have less homicides and less people shooting people in Asheville and breaking the community trust is is, is no way to achieve that and is harming all of us and then you know, there's the actual cost that governments pay and that taxpayers pay to incarcerate people, to take them through court, to um, to try to relieve homelessness because we've made it impossible for a person to have housing, um, other public services like, you know, food assistance and healthcare assistance and such that we are uh, diverting. And all these costs together probably overwhelm the cost of crime. So, just to really quickly wrap up, because I'm sure I'm running out of time, um, there's sort of what Brian was asking about to begin in to begin in this um, this conversation. The idea that we could cut 50% of the police budget, we'll figure out what we're going to spend it in af on after we vote for the cut, and some some talk that the services and the extra spending that that money could be diverted to could reduce crime in other ways, but that I, I included this just as a starting point. I don't even know that this is necessarily anybody's real starting position, but there's the idea that we could reduce police by half and good. And there's some, there's some actual background, and I included this in the resources on my website. There's some actual background. So police are actually great at doing, um, laboratory experiments of what happened if we reduced the police force. Because in cities like Chicago and New York and Washington DC, cities in Florida and other places, there have been known police shutdowns and slowdowns um, when, um, when basically like police unions or when, when there's public outcry over a police inaction. One of the main tools that police departments and police unions have used to sort of make their case or leverage against the public making that outcry is to say, fine, we just won't do our job. And this happens, it's crazy that it happens. I think, you know, like, I, I think about any other public official saying, I won't do what I've been mandated to do, fine, because you're, because you're being critical of me. And I can't imagine those people keeping their jobs, but there are several known police slowdowns and the data on them in many cases is, uh, fairly good from a police reform perspective. So there was a famous long police slowdown in New York where it was found that there was no corresponding increase in crime, no decrease in public safety when the police stopped arresting and issuing citations. 
Other cities have shown either a mix where crime rates have gone up, or at least temporarily gone up during the period of the slowdown or shutdown, or where things like property crimes and um, minor infractions would go down or stay down, but um, shootings would increase. And so there is there's mixed data, but there's some case if somebody was really willing to roll these dice, there's some case to say that reducing the police, I, I call it reducing the police footprint rather than reducing the police budget, because I think that's the main, I look at what's the main thing we're looking at is how to reduce interactions with, between the police and the public where an innocent person, a person who is not committing a crime, a capital crime, runs the risk of being um, killed or injured or a person who's committed a minor crime gets permanently diverted. So I think we're talking about reducing unnecessary, unnecessarily violent and harmful police interactions with the public. The but talking about the budget is the way to get there. But as you can see, it might not mean one, it may not be a one-to-one -one reduction that reducing the budget by half reduces police by half or reducing police by half reduces budget by half. So I'm using a different terminology from anybody else I've heard, but I'm talking about reducing the number of unnecessary police interactions with the public. Um, cons, and this is what Brian was getting at, people get worried, what if, you know, what if I am being raped or assaulted and there's no police officer near? What if I'm one of those 300,000 people that calls the, the um, city 911 or public service and they say, you know, we don't have somebody who we can send and it is something there. So that's, that's a fear that needs to be addressed before a conversation about this can go on, I think. Um, and then of course, like the mixed um, crime rates. Again, I put that up there because I think that is not, I, I don't think that's by, by far would emerge as a consensus position that we could just cut the police budget and, and go home. So there's the one that there's what people talk about the most and that's what Nina was getting at before. And that's the idea of replacing those police calls that are not violent, you know, armed response situations with somebody who's trained to deal with the crisis in a nonviolent way. And, you know, I should say I was a mental health worker for a number of years before I did what I do now. I was, um, I worked in my Peace Corps assignment was in a large um, mental health institution in the Kingdom of Jordan, where I saw people, you know, get bitten. I saw people in mental health crisis, um, saw, you know, people sustain injuries and people become escalated and aggressive in mental health situations daily as part of my, um, just my, part of my job description. I never saw a situation where I felt I would have benefited from being armed, least of all with a deadly weapon. So there's this idea, what about the situations that involve homelessness, that involve people with drug addiction, that involve people with having mental health crises being responded to by somebody who's unarmed, who is trained to deal with those in a way that's actually going to produce a better outcome and reduce the likeliness of things to escalate. Because one of the slides I didn't include in these is that over enough interactions between the police and the public, escalation is basically guaranteed. If you walk into a situation as a police officer with a person who is escalated and swinging and you try to grapple with them while you're armed, you're gonna run into a situation where you're afraid that your gun is going to be grabbed. You're bringing the weapon into the situation that's going to create the pretext to respond to it with deadly force. Okay, um, there's a lot of research that says that um, police officers are, even police officers, but even members of the public, when shown pictures, photograph, headshots of white and black people and asked to rate their strength and their pain tolerance on a scale of one to 10, consistently rate the, just based on looking at an image of somebody's head, rate the strength and pain tolerance of a, a photo of a black person higher than a, a, a photo of a white person. Even trained police officers who interact with the public a lot more than most of us do, and a, a wider probably demographic of the public than most of us do, and that ought to know better, rate, they, they rate black, people based on a photograph of them 
as basically invulnerable to pain at the highest levels of pain tolerance and strength. And why does this come into play? Well, y'all know, because every time there's an instance of Dylan Roof or a white person involved in a shooting, a white person holding a gun, pointing it at another person, there are just the the majority of those instances um, of those police interactions are going to lead to the white person being taken um, alive and unharmed and vice versa when it comes to black people. When you, you ask why does why is a police officer using a stun gun on a restrained person six to ten times until he dies of cardiac arrest, some of these unconscious biases that are that are baked into a lot of people um, happen and the more armed and the more loaded for bear a person entering that situation is the more it's to every you know to every hammer everything is a nail right you're it's more likely to escalate to violence and to require violence to resolve and so there's this idea what if we bring in social workers um what we see is that um there I, I think there is definitely the potential for that it would definitely reduce that among the cons and I think this is important to have in this conversation, a situation where you could, if you have those, if you go back to that graph of the police citations or the police calls, and you you take out of that list all the calls that were nonviolent situations, responding to trespassing, responding to drunk and disorderly, you probably arrive at something like 50% of police work that doesn't need a gun more than 50% of police work that doesn't need a gun to respond to. You do not necessarily respond to the idea that there needs to be 50% less police. And the reason for that is the same reason that if I fell off my porch and broke my leg leaving this meeting, the first thing that would arrive is a fire truck with all the firemen in its full in their full gear. And that creating a separate response tra task force doesn't mean that you don't need those firemen sitting in the fire department. There, you don't know on any given day the number of calls that are going to be um, that are going to require you know armed police officers and the number that are going to be non-emergency calls, and there's no coherent way to staff that up the way um, the way Asheville services are staffed, and so you'd end up in situations where there's police sitting around, a dispatcher's deciding, okay, send off the social worker, but you know it could actually potentially mean more emergency response. Um, there's also, you know, most, you know, existing crisis services when things get hairy are going to result in an armed response, um, police response anyways. That's what Asheville Social Services, um, basically all of them, the crisis services that I know of, are going to do the moment things get hairy. So you're, you're not necessarily reducing the chance that the most escalated situations are going to result in violence or shooting. Um, the costs, paying a person with an MSW is probably more than paying a, re a new recruit police officer 31 to $35,000 a year. So you're, pos you're potentially um, actually increasing your payroll and support services and not leaving this big portion, this $15 million of the city budget to get on other things. I, I suspect a social worker model would, if the city tried to establish it or contract it out, would basically devour the $15 million of savings from cutting the police budget and then some and on top of that there's actually in poor and non-white communities um there's actually their own history of mistrust and um and systemic racism among so-called social workers and people are going to say you know a social worker came and removed my child from my household or a social worker came and wasn't embedded in my community and was a well-intentioned white person, but came from outside my community and tried to tell me how to live my life. And it's not necessarily a situation that everybody would welcome as um, social work. And that brings me to my last slide and my last thing. And this is something I'm really excited about. I've started having a conversation with a couple of people that work in public health, including here in Bogan County. And their perspective is really interesting and it's this. Thinking back to those repeat offenders who either because they're homeless, they're um, previously incarcerated, they're released from jail or prison without identification or any kind of resource, they say, 
you think about in terms of all those 160,000 citations and arrests, you know, how the, the breakdown of that is, you know, 15 to 20,000 a year, right? You think about those 300,000 calls for service and, you know, the, the breakdown of that is, you know, a, about a hundred thousand um, calls a year, but you can reach some point, potentially even the majority of those that are actually, that actually involve a fairly small amount of people. Okay. One person I talked to the Buncombe County Health Department guessed that it could be 500 people responsible for, in, in Asheville, responsible for half of police work or police interactions with the public. You following this so far? The person, uh, when you talk to public health officials, they talk about these proven methods for protecting, for getting people who are likely to interact with the police, who have drug addictions, who are homeless, who are um, released, you know, former offenders, and getting them connected to a life that would protect them, that would keep them from continual engagement with the police. And the biggest portion of that, um, and the, the first portion of that that they all mention is housing. Getting a housing first model is proven to reduce crime and, and to proven to be a fairly low cost way to reduce crime when you think about other resources like police and courts and jails that would be involved in um, kind of continually enforcing on the same person. Getting them in the house just by itself takes care of a lot of that. Getting connected with um, food programs, um, getting them connected with jobs and occupational training, getting them just connected with somebody getting them without a car to the DMV so they can replace their driver's license so they can engage in most public activities. And the person I talked to at the county health department that tried to sort of suss this out based on the idea that it could be 500 people that were creating most, you know, half of the need for police in Asheville and what it would take to answer their needs based on the cost of existing county programs when it comes to drug addiction treatment and such comes to, comes down to eight or she guessed eight or nine million dollars okay so here we have a 15 million dollar you know what we have proposed is this 15 million dollar reduction in in policing or half of policing but we have on the other side of that equation we have something like half of, potentially half of police work involving a fairly small number of people who could be treated and permanently removed from continual reintegration into the criminal justice system for a lower cost than what we're spending on policing them as their share of the police budget. Do you follow that? And for me, this seems to have a lot of potential. And I think there's a lot of the numbers left to flesh out but the idea that the city has all this data, the city could find the 500 people who are most likely to turn up for offenses related to homelessness or drug addiction and, and potentially go find them where they are right now and, and offer services. And to me, an idea that would take, it's gonna take a lot of work and community support, but that comes with basically no cost and reduction in our safety in the public or our chances that our bike is gonna get stolen and could potentially save the city money and could take people who are basically damned to a hell of homelessness, drug addiction and continual re-entry into the criminal justice system on a track to a better life. And so I'm, you know, again, like I said about reparations yesterday um, or last week when I was talking with y'all, I, you know, I, I'm aware that my role is to allow the public input, input process to go through and to continue to pay, um, to pay attention and heed community voices about what their wishes are. But if something like this wasn't in the mix, I think, you know, that would be a real lapse in our attention and our ability. And that's, you know, that's something that existing mo that models exist for that the resources exist for. Okay, I made it through. Um, I have no idea what time it is, but I know there's been a lot of comments and questions. Does anybody have a question or a comment that they would like to ask before um, before we wrap up? Um, Rich, I I couldn't agree more that that finding the allocation of resources 
to those people and circumstances that are generating the greatest overhead in terms of demands on police time and also represent the most opportunities for imbalanced, improper use of force. I think that's mm -hmm. absolutely the case. And that the solutions clearly lie in housing, jobs, and reintegration, mental health services of all kinds. Of course, I think the big challenge here is not a fiscal one. The big challenge is that as a society, um, unfortunately, I think still a significant portion, if not a majority of the population deeply resists and resents the notion of giving quote unquote free stuff to the people who are perceived to be the problem, fairly or unfairly. So the notion that the folks who are taking up most of the police force's times are going to be the one who, ones who are showered with free or cheap housing, job training, mental health support, um, you know, food, yeah. food security and all that is, is very difficult for a significant portion of our voting population to wrap their minds around. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know what the, what the solution to this intractable problem is, but without a, a baseline support so that everyone in our society believes that they are entitled to decent housing, decent health care, um, a decent paying job, and so forth. The notion of providing those basic goods to the folks who have been identified as the source of societal ills is, is going to be a huge challenge. Um, it's one that I think we have to rise to, but I don't know if you have any thoughts about how to message around this that address that, because I think that's the primary problem. So I, I have two thoughts. First of all, I think it's changing. I think what I've seen this summer is like nothing that is like nothing that in years of following police reform debates and movements, Black Lives Matter movement is, you know, is eight years old at this point, you know, going back to Michael Brown. And it's, and yet I haven't seen anything like the shift of public support. I don't think that public, that shift is necessarily permanent at first. And I think the backlash is coming and I'm, I'm concerned about that. But I, I do think people's heads are just in a different place about that. I think when I come at it from how do I make this case as a potential public policy person, because I'm getting lots and lots of calls and emails on both sides of this, I think answering the resistance to this comes down to foregrounding the costs that we pay anyways. We don't save money by allowing somebody to be homeless. We don't save money by, uh, we don't save money by give it, by denying somebody a returned offender, return to the community, a chance to um, take their life in a different direction. Because there's not only the cost of jailing that person and the cost of our the police time to enforce on that person, the cost of the courts and the cost of you know the crime and replacing your bike and the cost of you know but we're, we're paying for a lot of public services and public cost anyways. And I think if in the final analysis that co those costs are going to be more than the cost of, of doing something right. We're, we're gonna run into a situation of cutting off our nose to spite our face by denying people basic and relatively low cost things, but incurring all these these less visible costs down the road in terms of being a less safe community, but also all the public support and all the criminal justice system that we pay for anyways. It's like the argument about foreign aid and, you know, a million dollars in foreign aid averts a billion dollars in the war, right? And so I think foregrounding that constantly 
for me, I find tends to short circuit the, the sort of, you know, revulsion that some people or the natural distaste that some people feel about, um, about providing community support to people who are quote unquote undeserving. I think the other part that comes into that is that you have to, we have to be able to make the case that the community will not be less safe. And the job of counsel, especially, is the job of thinking of unintended consequences. And it's not a fun job. It's, it was much more fun to be a community activist and say, do this, fund the transit, you know, stop the, you know, build this, the speed humps. And as you, you get into this, and I've been into this, you know, even though, you know, probably most people think I'm a council, but I'm not. But I've been involved in some way or other in city policy making for more than five years now. And you know, you you have to be able to answer, at least provide a satisfactory answer for unintended consequences. I think the argument that we can do this and, you know, magic, there's no more crime, is a non-starter, and you have to be able to start to make the case, we can do this, and I can make you some kind of basic guarantees that you are not going to be less safe in your community, and you'll fact probably be more. So highlight those two things. One, the cost is probably a cost saver in the long run. Two, we're aiming, we're going to make policy decisions that are going to result in a safer community. Ken, I saw you wanted to ask a question, right? And you're popping up here. What's up? It's good to see okay. you. Well, first of all, thank you so much for, for doing all the research and putting all these facts and figures together. And to me, it was very, very helpful to better understand the situation. Would it be possible for you to share the slides or at least the ones with all the, the, the facts and figures? Sure, I'll put it up on my website as soon as I get off the call here. So by this afternoon, if you look on richleeforashville.com slash police, and then, or if you just go to richleeforashville.com, as of right now, the widget will make it the first thing that you see. But okay. I'll, put, I'll put the slides. I can also just email it to save an email. Yeah, if, if you would email me a set too, because I want to forward it to some people. Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you for thank you for coming and participating. I know you live in the county, but I know your involvement here in the city is um, is, is pretty continual. And you know, like a lot of people, you're you're in that you're in that eighty thousand or so population that's not permanent city um, limits yep. residents, but whose lives you know circle around city limits. And so, yeah, you know, I think. Go ahead. And we will, we've also got uh, probably over four or five thousand Sierra Club members that live in the city. Yes, uh, and um, and I'll, I'll put in a plug for you because I don't know um, Nina and Laura saw on the call. I don't know, and, and anybody else who's watching this video after the fact, like several people said they were going to. Um, if you're not getting the Sierra Club newsletters, or if you're not opening them lately, take a look because the Sierra Club has made what seems like to me a really pronounced shift in its focus and its messaging since the since June and the outbreak of uh, protests over George Floyd and is having a conversation around you know like like a lot of you know I'm seeing organizations from the Audubon Society on down doing this but the Sierra Club is re would you say remaking themselves as a racial justice organization or just foregrounding the racial justice aspect of the things they've always worked on? Well, well yeah, I think we've, we've worked on a lot of that for, but I think we are, like many people, myself included, I have awoken to some realities and just how pervasive you know, some of the issues are and problems around social justice are, and, and certainly around the area of, of environmental justice. As a matter of fact, I'll put in another plug on the, September 3rd, our monthly Sierra Club program, which is by Zoom now, will feature William Barber III, Reverend Barber's son, mm -hmm. talking about the intersection of, of climate change and, and racial justice and uh, racism and, and all of that, how it intertwines. So be a great program if you're interested in those kinds of things. He's a good speaker. I saw him talk out at Kenilworth Presbyterian right. on environmental justice last year. and. Um, he's got a good spiel on it. And it's like this, it's a lot of slides and data. So if you enjoy these, he's, he's <laughs> got uh, a lot of data on the way that um, transport, everything from transportation to zoning decisions, a lot of the things that come down to city decisions, you know, yeah. 
one of the things about this debate, and we were talking about reparations on the last one of these of uh, Ben, and you know, there's a lot of that that's going to require big kind of federal actions that are sort of outside of the city's wheelhouse to address. But a lot of things when it comes to environmental justice are um, either directly created by local governments or, you know, really under the control in ways that some of these other things aren't. Uh, so I appreciate you being here. I'm also on the same web post that I just mentioned, richlyforashville.com slash police once the Zoom compiles the recording of this and puts it in a usable format, um, I'll post that. So anybody who was interested or missed something can, um, can find that on my website. Great. Laura, I'm gonna have to disappear, but thank you so much for doing this. Hey, no problem at all. I'm gonna jump off soon too. Laura, did you have anything, that, any comments or questions? No, I thank you for all the data. Again, I'll have to study some of it. I was frankly, quite surprised at the level of crime in Asheville being higher than much of the rest of the state. That just surprised me. I'm going to have to think about that and look at that a little more. I mean, it, it, I know you talked about it some, but it was, I didn't think of our city that way, frankly. Yeah, well, so, so think about it this way. Um, first of all, the main way to come at it is to remember that we're a city of almost 200,000 people and our crime statistics are of a city, you know, the denominator when it comes, when they put our crime statistics up, only count those of us that are permanent residents. So there are people downtown, probably right now because it's 1030 getting arrested for public drunkenness that may live in Atlanta or Charlotte and may not be uh, community members. There's also because of our fairly small population, an increase of one murder a year is like a 25% increase in murders. It's, it's not going from 600 murders to 602 murders a year, where that percentage wise, that's just no increase at all. We went from two murders about four years ago to 12 murders this year, so that's like 600 times, even though, you know, 12 people's lives were impacted by that in a real way. That's not something, I'm not, I'm not trying to diminish that, but your odds or my odds or Nina's or Ken's or, or, you know, most community members' odds of being a victim of murder in Nashville are still incredibly low. And so, um, and that's something there. And I mentioned this, but everything I hear from community members and from police is that a fairly small number of known people, maybe a few dozen, maybe less than that, of, um, you know, in, in many cases, younger people who um, have gotten involved in drug trade or, or gangs are driving a lot of that violent crime and driving a lot of it against each other. So both the victim of a shooting and the perpetrator of the shooting in some cases quick, are quick question. associated okay. with the gang. Go ahead. Um, I asked this in the chat, um, which you probably haven't seen yet. Are there statistics associated with arrests and citations that give the, that easily would allow you to see the home address of those persons so that you could, we could filter out what proportion of those citations or arrests are from people who actually live in Asheville? So the short answer is no. It is very easy to find where the crime happened. And I'll put, I'll point everybody to a resource called, oh, it's slipping my mind right now, but maybe if I vamp for a second, it'll, it'll pop back in. But Simplicity, so the Asheville, what's called Simplicity Data Tool, and search up, just look for the word Simplicity Asheville, will actually give you a crime map that you can change things like date ranges and everything else. Sure. Crimes are occurring. Um, so all erase arrest data is public. And there is a site called Asheville Police to Citizens where you can pull up a, the police report of everybody who's arrested or cited in Asheville. There is no good bulk collection um, way of, of gathering those all out. And even when it came to trying to identify the number of crimes committed by people um, who are homeless in Asheville, which I've done several times, you, if, you, if they list 19 North Ann Street or the address on Tunnel Road of the Veterans Quarters or Salvation Army Shelter 
as their addresses that, that makes them more likely to be homeless people. You can, you can see if they list an address outside city limits as their address, but you'd have to click, th at, as of right now, you have to click through everyone individually to find it, and it's very unwieldy. And even talking to the data gurus, which I'm not, I've not been able, they've not been able to find a way to do some kind of mass data dump that they can work with. Wow, yeah. that seems like, that seems like, that shocks me that, 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 that booking data is not, you know, entered with all that in nice separate fields. <laughs> you have to go take a look at it. It's Asheville Police to Citizens, is, if you Google search that. Um, it's, it's interesting, I mean, it's interesting what patterns you come across because you search by like a date range. So you say yesterday, for example, there were a hundred citations and arrests in Asheville. And you can go through and say how many were drunk in their disorderly conduct, you know, um, you know, conduct, or how many when the protests were going on. Um, several of us were pulling how many people were being arrested involved in the protest, like failure to disperse, which is you know the easiest thing to use on a protest, and um, and what were they being cited with. And so it's an interesting resource, but it's not designed for for bulk collection. Somehow it has to work because there's like the mugshot, the mugshot websites and stuff like that that you get a newspaper for. You can look up the mugshots in your community. There has to be some way to do it, but we haven't been able to find it yet. All right. That's good to know. <laughs> and thanks so much for uh, your presentation. It was extremely helpful. No problem. Um, you know, I'm going to, um, the, the next thing, probably the next thing I'm going to talk about next week, which you'll be interested in, Nina, is the, the situation and some of the kind of internal um, debate around the appointment to BJ seat. Um, but one of the things that is going to be heavily involved in that, if any of you guys have taken a look at the questions um, the, um, that councils can be using to decide who to do, is do you support 50% defund? Oh, um, yes. It's going to be throughout the election because appointment or not, I'm still running for election in November, and I'm sure it's going to be, it's, somebody's commenting on, on every post on my Facebook, on my campaign Facebook page right now. Do I support the 50%? And it, it, it's tough from a campaign perspective to take a position that says, yes, I think it's achievable, but I think it's going to not be in September. I do not think it's going to be a dramatic action. I think it needs community input and a lot more thought about how it's going to be carried out and what it's going to be replaced with. And that's going to it's going to lose me votes. It's going to put me in a position looking like, you know, a squishy moderate. But you, I can't, I can't come at it from any other way than my thought process about things. So having this out there is going to hopefully be some of the context. Oh, I see everybody dropped off my call all of a sudden. So I'm going to say bye, and um, I'll talk to you sometime soon, Nina. And thank you. For all right. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, Rich.